Okay, hey everybody, welcome to the OSC team meeting we're recording here, so let's get going on a agenda here. So just a few things and seeing what we can uh, organize on. So development hours that's working. We've got, um, please continue filling your hours. On today's agenda is continuing the saga of open product development and just a few things. Uh, results, so I'll report on the results and then see what, where else we are with Lex and Abe and anyone else who joins. So um, 3D printer, major point of development still. So you can take a look at the video from D3D version 18.01. That's a 12 inch version of the 3D printer. That's, um, I'm actually sending that out to person from one of the old workshops did some sample prints with that but I think the 12 inch version is going to be the one that's pretty important in terms of uh, it's a big bigger machine uh, more powerful and so forth so that it's it's a better product in general and it can allow us to print larger things just for us we're we're highly interested in much larger things like let me share my screen here um, no share right so larger things like more you know more industrial scale things up to printing of car body panels and <clears throat> glazing and plumbing fittings and everything else up to structure possibly some plastic lumber and stuff but that's that's where we're going here that's working in the background there there's Herman and in, in Australia he's doing a replication his machine is coming out really nicely I mean he's he's taking some good time to do it check that out uh, very nice um, he is putting in the time so uh, one thing he did add to the system was actually a little rubber insulators where the bed is mounted so that the that the heat doesn't translate to the printed printed parts which is actually quite good because if you say you want to print ABS and you have parts printed out of say PLA at the higher temperature for ABS you might get uh, melting of the actual parts so uh, pretty nice but I mean it looks pretty impressive altogether you see the the magnetic mount for the tool head which last time we talked about the potential of a 3 watt small laser cutter head on that so let's see um, Abe, do you want to fill in <clears throat> on any of the latest tractor work or power cube work? Any any updates on that? Yes, um, I can share my screen. Share too. the screen, yeah. Go ahead. <clears throat> Let's see application. Yeah. Um, so you know, long I, I was kind of updating the uh, some of the parts I found missing yet on what I thought were missing on the engine. There's a coupler. Obviously, I moved the, the, the coolers over to the other side where this exhaust is supposed to go uh, from the motor fan or starter area there. Mm -hmm. um, the, this, the only thing I changed recently, trying to update the, the Wait, engine. Wait, but hold on, hold on. This collar. Hold on a second, though. It's... Uh... What you're showing there? Wait, show this me the cooler. The right, right. Show me the cooler side. I think oh. you. The fan is in behind the starter on the engine, right? That air comes out of there. Hopefully, down down there specifically. Well, no, and it actually. Is... No, no, no. It actually no. goes. It's completely in front of the. You know the part that's that's the hexagon one two three four yeah. five. Th that's well, where the air gets sucked in. Pulled in. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, um, it's gone. I mean, it's it's. I figure it's just some fins on the front of the engine and behind the starter system, right? So that that's pretty standard, I think. Uh, I looked at the photos. Let's see if I can find. Yeah. Those photos, and, uh, because, so. I mean, the cooler, the, there, there's holes all around that, that octagonal, uh, octagonal part. Let's see over those photos. Right. Um, uh, because I figure air, you know, it may not come in or go a specific direction. 
out of there. I uh, see what I was looking at was photos you took of 1708, and yeah. that wasn't uh, necessarily fully assembled either. Oh, oh there they are. Okay, so what do I have to do? Share Albums. a different. Wait, no, I'll post the link to what I'm talking about, I think. Because uh, you have the link somewhere. But, okay, so link in the, in the side to these photos. Um, there's shots of, of the engine there. And it looks like, you know, there's holes there. Um, and I didn't see another area where I would expect the air to come out that I could put the cooler that wouldn't interfere with the starter. In fact, uh, that starter, it's kind of on the corner there next to the where that cooler would sit. So I, I just assumed that you'd be able to pull that out of there, you know, around that corner of the frame. I see. And the cooler would be back in that corner. So I, I don't know what else. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, so it's... Yeah, I see what you're saying. Nah, but in practice it doesn't work like that. It's, I mean, in practice you see like the highest pull straight in front of the, the big hole, which is the one, like in the center. Nah, I mean it's pulling in from all sides, so it's kind of like, the most yeah. the most breath, you get directly in front of it. It's not at the side. If you put it at the side, you're just getting like, a tiny amount of that. Okay. So, yeah. So Another thing I was thinking, I'll go back to the, the cab. Yeah. Um, I started thinking, you know, we have all these problems with the electric fan stuff. Yeah. And let's see, in those photos there, that pump setup is not assembled. That was 1708 again. So, yeah. Uh, but there's this um, sleeve coupler that goes over. Let's see if I can make this transparent real quick. Uh, and we can see maybe in there. Um, so, in here, the, there's the shaft coupler that goes on the shaft in this sleeve. I just added because that was missing. I, I didn't see that in the photos, but I assumed yeah, yeah. that no, you're works right. out well for that. I yeah, yeah. Know. Because that seems, um, it makes kind of a monolithic component that you're not going to have, like, vibration problems if you try to make another uh, mount for the pump on the back end. Okay. Right? Um, um, okay. But, yeah, no, actually what I need to do is, um, I think I, what I need to do is, yeah, you're right, this power cube, where's our 17.10, because that should, let me see if we have 17.10, because... Let me open another CAD thing. PC 1710, yes. no, we really have, let's see, tractor 1710, okay, that might, some of that might be there. Um, let's see. No, I, what I need to do is show you the actual as-built, because the as-built, yeah, it was actually a little different. We used, we just homebrewed our little coupler, because we just used like a two-inch pipe and put flanges on it. Why? Because we ended up cutting down the shaft of the engine to make everything shorter. Like you see in your CAD, your CAD reflects it. It's, see how long that coupler is? What we ended up doing is cut the, like an inch or two off the shaft, and we only had like a one and a half inch of shaft left and therefore we condensed up made it much tighter and actually I think your power okay. cube reflects that that it's a little too long right yeah it is it is a little bit long yeah, there now I I wondered about that I wondered yeah yeah you'd mentioned cutting that off before so I yeah we probably need exact dimensions on that yes and then the coupler the, or the sleeve yeah goes over there. Um, I don't know the dimensions on that already either. I adjusted per the dimensions because somebody else six inches long in the cab before, so I yeah, I'm gonna adjust that too. To yeah, match. I need to take a picture um, for you. Yeah. But what I was thinking is we have all these fan issues. And I was yeah. wondering. I know some of that pipe that you're using to make that sleeve coupling there is kind of expensive, but it's just a short piece. But if that's fairly large, I was wondering if there's a way we've got that motor there maybe we could put a fan in there like 3d print some crude thing that fits on that coupler inside and then just cut you know just torch hmm. some holes in this pipe and make it blow air somehow yeah simply yeah but you know that would use existing parts mostly but yeah. I, I don't know how much cfm you'd get out of something like that uh that's I doable i don't think it's 
Yeah, I mean it's doable, but I don't think it's particularly easy. If we have yeah. the fan in the front, uh, it's easier to use the fan in the front. Yeah, so I guess it depends on yeah how the air flows around there. And, and it sounded like with this auxiliary and the small cooler that the heat wasn't as big as an issue. It's almost passive is almost enough, right? Yeah, that yeah, that was the whole point that. We have definite serious sucking in of air at the at the fan, and just by observing how strong that is, it does look like it's it's good enough to, for what we do. It definitely has visible flow. Yeah. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a way we can manage the airflow somehow around there. Um, yeah, it should be, I mean, it should be sufficient. We should be good. I mean, we should, um, what we need to do is test it okay. and make it work because I'm pretty confident it would work. And then, of course, ultimately you go to the actual build and running it for a few hours and see if you get any overheating. But I think it should be good. So, oh. yep. Okay, so the cooler setup is okay. And then I just need to adjust um, these parts on to be adjusted. And... I was uh, kind of making that section in the engine pump into a whole module and uh, trying to constrain that stuff. And I had, that's yeah. I've been worried about the CAD. You were talking about last time how it needs to be easy enough for other people to edit. Yeah, a lot of that's right. To come in and we've gotten this kind of complex thing where we're trying to get the constraints to make it easier to change yeah. things without a lot of, in a certain workflow process. But that also adds a certain amount of complexity and still get some bugs and things. Sometimes I was having issues earlier and training some of these parts and it, it's not an immediately obvious linear process flow. I, I think there's some complex decision tree because, well, I say bugs, but some of it I think is there's not enough clear documentation. And of course the underlying software can be better, obviously, I guess, but yeah. You know, probably understand enough of the underlying code in the proper order to use the constraints and, and things well enough yet. So it, there's, you know, instructions and documentation on using FreeCAD to some of this way, but I don't think it's thorough enough yet. Uh, so it can be, I think, difficult maybe to edit some of these files once they get a little more complex. Which yeah, yeah, I mean, the idea ultimately... It, for any construction set is that you can import one part at a time which means that so say you have the pump you have the engine and and you kind of are supposed to work from somewhat from scratch because the idea is that you can modify the frame size modify the arrangement if you need to so it's more important as long as we have the library parts that are that are good to go then it should be workable to get the higher level design from that so once again the construction set approach where we focus on the parts as long as we have th have those that are pretty exact then we can manage the rest yeah. of the process we yeah come up i think with ways to like in this document where i've got these other parts on the side and it's down there they're hidden over here and they're editable and when you clone yeah. them i think we've kind of gone over this you can just assemble them and constrain them into this, but you can always go back and edit the original parts yeah. here, and it'll just update the parts over here. As long as they're constrained in a reasonable fashion, it all just updates when you make changes. When Ideally, you use the clone? It, 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 yeah, yeah. Okay. Because we so that's, I guess those. that's another, so that makes it another possible workflow instead of the full-fledged uh, assembly constraints, right? Using So um, that, that's a simpler well, it, way. it uses the constraints because... Um, yeah, you constrain the clones and if the constraints work out which sometimes they seem a little bluggy if the flow is it right because I don't understand the right order to do it maybe um, but it it um, once you constrain those parts the constraints will always update yeah the, right for the clone parts yeah so no that's good all the constraints are there it it should update that way um yeah. But, but yep. we also just assemble uh, simplified larger parts in there, and then there's those files are merged in. We talk about you know the workflow to merge, mm -hmm. and 
usually there's, as Roberto talked about this before, there's a part where I found it easier is to import a, usually a simple part, like I use the end of the chain or something, and then import it with the assembly to lock it so that it can't move and then constrain all the parts to that locked part so it's easier to not have them move around in strange ways mm -hmm. because sometimes the constraints were difficult with that so that that began the uh -huh. general way they were doing um yep let's see uh anyway back on the power cube in general uh i've got a bunch of detail parts so i was going to start on getting those feet in there mm -hmm. uh some mm -hmm. of the little, that somewhat flex office flex like rubber feet uh, yeah rubber feet that's important for vibration so I think I think that those are. I don't know if they're. Any, yeah, I mean, this whole system is vibratory. Vibration is bad for, uh, you know, uh, wear and tear. So uh, obviously you need those in there. And mm -hmm. Assembly. Uh, I think those are an inch. But if we need to get de more detailed than that about that. I, uh, yeah. I guess the issue is getting more measurements if we need to, and I guess that's. Uh, I guess mostly up to you there on the farm getting uh, things measured. Yeah, they should be. Is. Those feet should be. I don't know if you found them in the BOM, but you should be able to pick that off the BOM. Were you able to do that? Oh. oh okay. I thought that they were just came with the engine. No, they don't. They're, they're a, no, that's okay. So they're in a separate item. Part. I, I, didn't, I didn't see those. I'll, I'll look that up. Yeah, separate and somewhat important because if they're an inch high then you're adding an inch and you have to consider that for the height of the power cube because in one of them that we simply were too tall and that's why that was part of the reason why we had to put the in one of the power cubes the cooler on top because once the engine was raised by the feet things didn't fit like we thought they would so yeah, yeah. okay yeah i think i think these fittings on top and everything were okay before and they're part of that i split but i think i need to double check fittings and mm -hmm. I, I don't know that anything should change if that, if that pump is the same uh off the shelf part i don't know are those do you have multiple of those in stock and planning to use more of those or are they likely to be different in the next build look because at the, the look planning. at the bom i think we're probably going to use the same thing as in a bom okay yeah in a 1710 yeah. version 17.10 suppliers yeah it's pretty it's pretty it's consistent um and then the only other thing i would call out for is um a part library dedicated to hydraulic fittings that's one of those things that we always pick from so for the the hydraulics construction set you want to have all those parts readily available because that's a very distinct and clear part of of just about any of the heavier mechanical devices we always use you know these valves these fittings these hoses so um, maybe you can start i don't think we have a hydraulics library uh if you can start that and maintain that yeah. that would I've be very useful just like Ru ruslan so actually ruslan has been working on a pipe just regular pipe and fittings more like pvc pvc pipe and fittings so and that's also in common use so if we get one for hydraulics that would be uh, a good piece of the construction set. Yeah, because he's, he's working on like a code or workbench, maybe that yeah. generates pipe yeah. fittings. Yeah. Okay, so maybe eventually that'll that'll grow. Yeah, it's a little more pipe fittings. Or pipe fittings. Yeah, a little more complex for hydraulics because um, they're not as standard yeah. as the standard pipe fittings. Oh. So the workbench would be a they're little more complicated. Yep. More different types of threading. Yeah. Compatible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, we're usually not displaying the complexity of threads. It's kind of a crude representation, but I, right. I don't think we need to get that detailed. Yeah, threads not necessarily. Um, and, and yeah, and you were mentioning, I think last time too, some representation for uh, houses. I, I don't think we yeah. necessarily have to put the houses in detail, but just some representation, yeah. color coded maybe, yep. like we've been doing. Yep. Um, let's see, is there something else? I had a list of stuff on my log. It's gonna. Uh, what are they? I think. Yeah, there's a few details, and I, I'm hoping that engine is de 
detailed enough in general, so we have enough information to work off of it. Right. It won't be right. And it. yeah, as far as you know, That's as far as a, like when we get this thing pretty detailed, I mean, I can actually, you know, well, actually, the best workflow on this power cube would be. So right now. Probably in a week or so, I'll get back down to the workshop and start working with a torch table. It's really cold here right now. But I think what we want to do is, once this is all finalized, some simple cuts and you know, on the torch table or, or just assembling this so we can verify uh, to the minute detail. Because I think we're very close to a power cube that's, you know, we can really crank them out now. Just, you know, I, I'm thinking, like I've been, so as I mentioned, I'm writing a book on, to drop the knowledge but in it I'm thinking okay what does a 160 horsepower horse tra uh, 160 horsepower tractor look like where you're getting to like d6 d7 scale of bulldozers and stuff like that cat d7 and um, 10 power cubes that's what it takes so it'd be like a whole battery of them and it's so sounds kind of crazy but if each one of them is simple enough like a leaf on a tree by biomimicry it does make sense it's like when every unit is so inexpensive and easy to maintain then it does make a lot of sense like you know instead of a breakdown it costs you thousands of dollars or you have to replace an engine you're just snapping out one of these units which it could be very promising so that's something to test and we're at a point where uh, we're close to that um, I saw something about a quad track you were posting yeah, on the Yeah, right. And it like yeah, it looked like you were suggesting larger engines, though, like 40, double the horsepower. With well, no, actually, that's that. uh, those are the hydraulic motors. See, each one of the hydraulic motors that we currently use as the standard high-traction motor is, it can handle actually up to 40 horsepower, meaning that each one of those motors can handle a couple of power cubes. That's, that's what I meant by that. So okay. currently they're the hydraulic motors on the wheels they can take more power than a single power cube has so like two and a half power cubes per motor but a good version that i've been thinking about is okay you, you use the same tracks the exact same tracks that we've used on micro track which are way overbuilt they have one and one half inch track pads they have um well we have designed them with the the large motor but you can put up to well, each one of those tracks put four of those tracks on a much bigger machine, and then you have a very, very powerful tractor. So basically, a supersized, basically the same modular element as the micro track, but four of them, four of the track units, as opposed to two. And each track unit, if we want to, we can drive it with up to two motors, like one, one on each side. Um, Kind of the same uh, high track configuration but two two drive motors so you can using the same design pattern you can make some super heavy traction machines and we're talking about cat d6 d7 territory which is uh up to th using okay so the numbers are the calculations are using eight of our hydraulic motors we're up at twenty eight thousand pounds of traction that's pretty serious or at four four motors you know four tracks four motors for about 14,000 pounds so that's we're talking about scaling the same system as on a tiny micro track to a huge machine so that's that's the that's the idea there and that is quite exciting because um, and I think we're gonna have to do that this year uh, if we've got the torch table running and we can build all the power cubes we can we can do that so uh, probably I would consider putting that on on a s schedule for like October, not, not October, like August or something like that. Um, well, and a smaller power cubes prototype that a little earlier. Keep tr keep testing the micro track, which is out. Uh, it's kind of cold and frozen out there right now, but once it warms up, we're gonna take that out a little more and and run it. Okay, but let's move on to uh, <coughs> other topics. Abe, is that good enough for now? Yeah, I think um, I'll work on the details, uh, continue on that. And, mm -hmm. um, I, I got a few details to do that. We don't have a lot of, I guess, team members for your just we break down for that. But I'll, I'll just keep chipping away on that, and I'll continue chipping away some of the library wiki update stuff. And I think, what else, too, Eric 
uh, is really working on the week getting a little more detailed. Oh, yeah. With a lot of that stuff, so the wiki is getting uh, a lot more detail in it. Um, and uh, I haven't even looked at the tractor lately with getting this cube, some of them, the whole tractor yet, because I'm still waiting on the details, so that may be later this week, but uh, I don't even know where um, what they're left on the tractor, but <clears throat> I'll try to get the cube first because that's got to go into the tractor. So, yeah, I think that's. I think that covers it on the power cube. Okay. Um, thank you. The next thing, uh, yeah, talking about Eric. Eric is a guy who's just going off on a on a wiki. If you go to, um, there's been a historical milestone has been reached. Actually, this guy's got more edits than I do right now per week. Like per, if you go to, uh, let's see, recent wiki changes or let's see, special pa pages active active uh, list of active users let's see I've got I'm recording this I'm gonna go to active users list this one Eric has 484 edits in the last 30 days whereas March and well actually I have a little more I have 661 but last week I checked he actually had more edits than I do in the last 30 days <laughs> mm -hmm. but that's pretty uh, interesting that someone's uh, going off on the wiki which is good news okay um, but moving on just one more thing I want to announce for that for 3 p.m. Uh, we know we have Shane who is in the background working on on the CNC circuit mill we're meeting at 3 p.m. so for anyone who wants to stay after this meeting you're welcome to but anyway let's go on to the next so maybe uh, let's see 13 inch frame D3D CAD. This is awesome. Roberto, that's you. You want to talk a little bit about it? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. That's looking pretty well, good. Yeah, um, well, I just finished the, um, the extruder and the heated bed, and I, I, I'd like to, to hear some comments about that and, and also. Uh, and specifically about the heat of it, because I I added um, a piece of wood in the base to level the the heat the heat of it. because uh -huh. the, the, without that leveling the, the um, I, I I was having problems with the first layer when printing. Oh really? You couldn't get it level enough with the way it was a little just enough slanted that you have to put a. It's a piece of wood that's under the heated bed right now. There, like uh, yeah. you know, like six millimeter. Or how, how? Yeah, about six or seven millimeters. Uh huh. Uh, below and with some spring, four springs and, uh -huh. and just for bolts, then adjust the, the level and and it it, it works. Uh, very very well oh very good oh interesting so yeah if anyone wants to look at my screen I'm look taking a look at the file right now yeah that's pretty good so the the idea here was this is updated so I, I believe this is the first actual as-built CAD uh, we've we've thrown around many of the the versions of the machines but a lot of them we we never really had a fully updated one so this appears to be one of the first ones if not the first fully updated actual design even though you've got the <laughs> okay you've got the extruder holder upside down um yeah now yeah, it works doesn't it <laughs> so yeah but um i guess it would be more secure like if it wants to fall down it can't fall down if it's the other way around um can you just flip it and switch it right over? Because we, we should definitely reflect that as the preferable method. Because, I mean, if that screw gets loose, the, the extruder plane falls out, whereas if the screw gets loose, it's much harder for it to, for it to fall out of the, the holder. This part right there, if that is, um, the stand is on the bottom, like the, the platform is on the bottom. Uh, is that something you can change easily? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, that's what I want to hear because... <laughs> I, I just assembled the thing as as I as I, I thought in that moment. Uh huh. And but if you if you if you tell me some changes, I, I yeah. can't do that. Okay. 
Well, I'm also looking at, let's see, so, so the extruder in these designs here is facing the actual orientation. If you have the standard OSC orientation, the extruder is facing back and the Y motors are at the back. So I'm looking at as as my in my screen, that's the correct orientation. The end stop on the left side for the X, the end stop on the outside for the Y, and no end stop on the Z. Um, everything else pretty much, I guess it looks pretty good to me. The, yeah, as far as that wood, let, let me see that, what you got there. and. And you put four springs between the the platform and the wood and a heated bed. Yeah, a bolt and uh, and little bolts. And the nut be below. The, yeah, little three millimeters. Uh huh. And, well, that's and a, and a nut below below the wood. Okay. And uh, push the the heated bed uh, upwards. Yeah. So yeah, it works. Okay. It works. So it'd be good for a start to uh, draw that detail in. That would be good. So we have a completely accurate detail. Um, and let's see. The next question that I would ask for is what are we getting as far as the usable print bed area? Because I know we've got some constraints on that. We're not using the 8x8 eight eight right now. What's Do you have some data on that? Uh, well, and my the largest the largest um, uh, printed piece that I that I have done mm -hmm. was um, 14 millimeters by 15 millimeters. That's mm -hmm. about six inches so I, and when I move the, um, the extruder I, I calculate that it should be possible to print uh, six by 6.5 inches mm -hmm. six by 6.5 inches okay and um, yeah um, so here's a couple of more comments so so take these two notes down let's let's if possible optimize it because the idea here is this is using the 13 inch frame so if we're using cnc cutting we cut out first the 16 inch frame and this is the second nested frame from the inside of that so that's why we have the axes on the outside to get more of the usable area but actually we also have the axes on the outside on a 12 inch version where with the axes outside you can use the 12 inch area on the larger machine with a 16 inch frame but what we can do here, so let's talk about this for a couple of changes. So on the x-axis, you can get yourself a little bit more room if you put spacers underneath the axes. Uh, do you see that? So okay. the four attachment points, you can put spacers in there. And therefore get up to the full 8 inch of the bed. Uh, and that's probably... You know, I guess how important is that for somebody? I mean, it definitely helps to get eight by eight inches as opposed to like six by six and a half. Like for example, on printing the filament maker, there were parts that you needed the eight inch bed fully for the filament maker, the Lyman filament maker as an example. And typically the eight by eight is the standard, so a lot of parts might assume that you might have an eight by eight perhaps but that would be I would say that would be worthwhile that would be quite simple you can put just little uh, I mean you can use washers as spacers but the only thing is you would need longer longer bolts which um, you might not have um, you can use threaded rod as an example but what we want to do to make this official is to uh, I probably like for the official release like we do want to go to the eight by eight inch so therefore uh, draw in uh, you could do 3d printed pieces but it, it's it's pretty easy to do if you just do little washer spacers like a bunch of little washers uh, though they tend to fall off or just larger nuts so what we want to do is select okay how do we get that spacing happening there is it going to be a 3d print do we just want to I mean another way to do it is actually put nuts washers and nuts where the nuts are actually um, clamping so you have empty threaded rod as the spacer like the the bolt itself could be as 
used as a spacer because it's plenty strong like a little quarter inch boltus or six millimeter bolt is plenty plenty strong to do the extension so that's actually one way to do it and maybe that's um, perhaps the easiest one because you're just using the bolt that you're using anyway but you're using like two more nuts to to hold the uh, the axis at the as far distance as you like in fact if you use threaded rod you can make that spacing larger <laughs> larger and larger <laughs> to the point that if you imagine that if you've got um, you know right now you got like six inches if you make the space an additional three inches on each side which you can still do with a threaded rod then you can fit in a 12 inch bed in there which is uh, yeah. pretty interesting so I would propose doing that uh, but for this just just wor worry about the 8 inch bed uh, maybe if you can select like a standard part so this is not guesswork this is replicable select a standard part of McMaster car or some other source where you show exactly what that length of that bolt is and it can be some random length it has to be a bolt that's sourceable like it can be like 23 millimeters it might have to be 25 millimeters because they don't make 23 millimeter bolts unless you go special order things like that so so select a standard length that you'd like there and source it and make it happen in CAD and then we can add that to our official uh, 13 inch D3D version so does that, does that sound pretty clear? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay, so we addressed the x-axis. Now let's move on to the y-axis. It's a little more tricky there because we don't have as much play there. But what we can do is if you observe the, the rear left y where the motor is with the end stop, um, you can gain yourself about one one inch or one and a half inches <clears throat> if you bolt it let's see you don't have the bolt okay so I would like what I would like you to definitely do add to this CAD this the exact bolt holes because then we can get those yeah. bolt holes CNC cut and that's that's all comes in a kit uh, but here you're not showing the bolt holes but if you instead of the the outer bolt holes like towards the end of the the axis use the inner bolt holes and right there you've earned yourself about an inch or more than an inch it's it's that's like that spacing between two bolt holes yeah uh, so so move it over one bolt hole does that make sense mm, not really because um, with the current uh -huh. configuration the yeah. um, the position of the extruder when the X ah. touch the end stop I see. He's in the limit of the heat of the... Okay, very good point. And that brings us to the following plan then. We know that the Prusa i3 extruder is different and it's it's part of its advantage is that it takes us less space. Like right now we've got, we're taking up a lot of space, probably like one or two more inches than we need. Uh, the Prusa i3 extruder is actually much more flat, so that will gain us an inch or two there. So maybe the procedure would be... Um, as you develop this one you can well I mean uh, the CAD you can do any time but as far as the real build what I would maybe focus on is is do the you know as after this meeting I would actually recommend to go to the Prusa i3 extruder since that's a priority for everyone like I want to retrofit it to my machine here so maybe work on that but with that you're gonna gain, gain yourself the the y-axis motion a little bit and then on the other side the way you have the short piece there, yeah, you cannot gain much there um, because you're towards the end of the, yeah, pretty much towards the end of the frame there. So we can gain about an inch. Uh, did you say six and a half was on the X or Y that you have? Um, I think it was um, X. Uh-huh. Okay. So say you have six on the on the Y, we can get up to seven. But beyond that, yeah, we're pushing the limits. But check this out, just like we did the spacer on the X axis. Um sorry, on the Y. You, yeah, to extend the X axis you put the spacers on the Y to, to widen out the space between the Ys. 
You can also do the same for the Z's. If you put spacers underneath those, then you can gain yourself like an inch or two uh, where the Z motor is mounted on the, where the motor is yeah, interfering. Right. So you could, yeah, so you could gain one inch, like say one and a half, I'm hoping for like one and a half inches from the extruder upgrade. Let's see, what it is, what it is it right now? Right now, that extruder length is like three inches or so. We could probably get down to like about half of the, probably save one and a half inches. We can probably get two inches out of spacing out the um, the Z. So we could probably end up getting like three inches as a practical amount. So three inches added on to six would be like nine. So we could get like nine by 12 max if we wanted to use the like a big 12 inch bed underneath the 13 inch frame so those would be worthwhile but yeah i would say focus right now on the on moving on to the extruder um because that is a weak point like right now there's it's just the, the way the i don't like the way the the probe is mounted it's it's not too stable and i was wondering did you have any issues with the probe being straight and or is it problematic um sometimes the it doesn't um, doesn't activate. Yeah. And the this, this the the beds keep moving upwards. Yeah, yeah. This mounting, I don't like it. It's it's a little unstable, and I know that when a machine gets really hot, sometimes you can the the plastic there actually can warp, and the probe can bend a little. I mean, twist a little slightly, and then it doesn't sense as well. And the other thing, actually since that's been a recurring issue like that the gap that we have right now between the and you, you have that the pretty nozzle. accurate yeah between the nozzle it's about typically we have the probe about one millimeter higher would you say is that about right or yeah it's yeah, about a millimeter um, but that's actually very tight I mean sometimes the I've, I've had the probe hit the work pieces uh, here and there um, especially like if you get some some misprint and something sticking out it's very easy for the probe to hit because it's right above the print it's very tight so what I would actually suggest um, and I think it's a good idea go from the four millimeter which is what we're using I think it's called the four millimeter probe like it's a tiny one well four millimeters sensing distance I think we want to go to the slightly fatter one which is the eight millimeter sensing distance one some people use that and I've, I've heard that uh, being used to give more clearance to the uh, to the print bed. We're using a an aluminum bed, which is less sensitive than than met metallic like iron metallic. So that's why the probe gets so close. It's supposed to be four millimeters away, but it's really about one millimeter after you count in the PEI surface printing surface. So uh, I would suggest. So Roberto, maybe if you could try, uh, when you modify the Prusa i3, you can try with the existing extrude, the existing probe, but I would actually do both. Do one for the four millimeter probe and then look up the one that's that's got eight millimeter sensing distance and it's gonna be a little wider and put that in there as well. Uh, Cause I can tell you that this four millimeter sensing probe is going to work well with when we have steel and steel may be what we use for larger machines because steel is very inexpensive but for now we're definitely using aluminum um, for in part because the of the aluminum print bed which is integrated with the heater the heater print bed is aluminum so that's 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 what you get but when we go to making our own heat beds we can definitely consider steel, which is heavier, but che way cheaper, like three times or so cheaper, which means uh, you can get much lower cost, larger scale machines when we talk about one meter print bed size, that kind of size. So, um, yeah, uh, if I could have you do both, that would be great for the Prusa. Have you looked any into the Prusa um, extruder? Yeah, yeah, I have the... the parts for printing awesome and have you seen a difference between i3 mk2 and mk3 are they different yeah yeah i think the the um i well the, the last 
one has um, has filament or the diameter of the filament. It's got what? A sensor. Um, sensor. Filament sensor? For the filament, yeah. Oh, you think we're ready for that? I, I remember that. Um, well, I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure. Filament sensor, is that a uh, filament sensor for run out, correct? Run out, like when it runs out? For, yeah. Yeah. For run out. No, I think yeah. we, we would want to have that. Um, I do believe, Mar let's see, I'm not sure if Marlin supports it, but uh, we should definitely get that. Does Marlin support filament run out? Does anyone know? Sensing? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I, I know uh, this was probably a year or two ago. There was some functionality for that. I'm not sure. Yeah. State, okay. Uh, I know that, like, I was actually talking with Joseph Prusa at the Open Source Hardware Conference. Oh, nice. Talking about how Marlin's gotten to be so big that, like, they're running out of stuff they can put in it. Yeah. Because it doesn't fit on the Arduino memory anymore. Yeah. So, um, but I know that filament sensing was was something that was in. Like, okay, yeah, that's good. No, I think um, I think the answer to Roberto is we should go with the filament sensing. I that is very useful if you. I mean, you're you're doing a long print and then it just cra just messes it up because you ran out, right? Ran out of filament. That's very very useful. I mean, especially for large jobs. So let's let's go up go with the latest version is that are those parts available for the latest version or they're not yet do you know uh, yes yes they are, are they I, are at least the um, the printed parts the the cut okay let's I, do that I, I have. can we do that Let's do that. Let's let's get updated with the latest Prusa i3. And, it's, and this is the way that open source works. I mean, hopefully we can make that work for us by building upon what they've done, which is good. And they definitely have a good extruder. So, uh, but it's not three millimeter, which we were will want for later for larger prints. So um, that's that's what you get. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so you, Roberto, do you have enough to go on for now? Excellent. Well, good work here. So, yeah, we're that's uh, definitely like the 13 inch uh, version is important. The 16 inch is uh, the largest of like when, when you have a 48 inch sheet of metal, the 16 inch, that's why we selected 16. So you have z literally z zero waste. So 16, like three of those fr fit across a sheet of metal that's standard in the United States. And then we have the nested frames. Great. Let's move on. Um, Okay. Hey, real quick, Martin. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious. What's the like current part co uh, part count? Like unique part count on yeah. D3D? Yeah. Do you have like enough cost on? I'd like if someone wanted to go build their own. Uh, for a 12 order, it's 329 dollars. For a one order, it might be like 500. I don't know. But you, if you're willing to wait, you can get it for like 329 dollars. You get it off uh, places like AliExpress. Yeah. It's not a it's not a lot. It's uh it's pretty decent, but you're gonna have to have somebody print you some parts. Um, uh, the the printed parts. I think if you get a quote from somebody like a 3D printing service, it costs like a hundred bucks. But um, I put the bill of materials that says 329. That has got that accounted for at fifty dollars for printed parts. Does that answer it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you ever seen any of the, the rep straps that are out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, many of them. I mean, you can do it for cheap if you scrounge parts, but when we're saying like the $329, that's for a pretty replicable version that you can be sure you source cool. all the parts without variation. So, yeah. Yep. All right. So let's let's move on to, to Josh, maybe since you, you piped up there. Uh, any updates on uh, MicroTrack updates? Uh, I don't have any updates. I've, I've just uh, been kind of laying low for the holidays. But, yeah. Um, kind of back at it. So I think the order of operations is uh, we've got 
uh, work on the frame, um, and that's kind of just updating based on the last last build. Yep. Uh, then we're going to be looking at that tensioner. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, nothing is super new. Um, okay. The motor assembly and its mounting, and that's kind of related to the tensioner as well. Um, yep. The loader arm pivot. Do you want to? Um, oh yeah. Quick that i haven't heard as much about that oh yeah well just one update so since the since the workshop happened uh we did some field testing one thing i discovered was that the tilt the curl the dump of the bucket is was too too small it was like 30 degrees or so so i actually changed the pivot the top cylinder attachment on the quick attach plate put it closer to the bottom point such that the cylinder is making it move at a long, larger angle so it now dumps pretty much vertical gotcha. so that took closing in the the top hole by about like I think two inches I moved it in so I can take a picture of that so instead of that separation being like whatever we had like 10 inches it might be like eight inches now so that's that's a major shift as far as the design Beyond that, it's pretty much um, pretty much the same. So that's that's something I can take a picture of and, and um, update that. Mm -hmm. So I, I owe you that picture, and for Abe, I'll take the picture of the coupler, which we did not from the off-the-shelf parts, but we which we built ourselves off two-inch heavy wall pipe. So, yep, we'll go forward with that. Yeah, and then so next on the list. He kind of had the, the loader arms triangle pieces. That was those little pieces right. we welded on. Yeah. The arms. Yep. Yep. Did you, did you like that configuration, or were you, are you just thinking that we would... Because I was thinking we would just change the shape of the arms. Change the shape of the arms. Hole. No need for the extra pieces when you could put cut it all out of the same piece. Uh, when it came down to reality, we, we just weren't prepared enough to, to yeah. figure that out before the event, so... Yeah, no, we want to just pretty much raise the arm geometry a little bit so we don't have to add those pieces. They're already, the holes are going to be within the arms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. But um, we want to, we do want to document this for um, the sake of, um, yeah, just getting, you know, making sure we have this complete model. Even though it's, you know, like a lot of the, like, I don't think we're going to suggest anybody build those loader arms, but since we have that, I think it's 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 good to have that in CAD because then we can do, you know, as we test it, we can uh, work with the CAD and figure things out and stuff like that. So, so I mean, altogether, it's it's quite pleasing. I mean, the the results are good. I mean, the machine works well. I mean, it could move dirt around and move around relatively easily. So, yeah, pretty good, pretty good, pretty satisfying yeah. result. Still end up with like a little bit, of value, right? But there's some points where it's like turning. Really stuff, right? Yeah, the part about turning is difficult. Is that that's one shortcoming of this? If you, like, once I put on the bu put on the bucket with a full load of soil, it is hard to turn. Whereas we didn't see that in during the workshop because we could spin circles, but that's because we didn't have the loader arms on, uh, and yeah. no weight on a loader, so we could really turn that thing around in place. So what to do about that? What I'm thinking for the next version, we can gain just a little bit by decreasing the size of the drive sprocket. We can go from like uh, the current eight eight tooth, maybe down down to like six teeth, and it would still probably work well. So we would gain ourselves like 30% more more torque. So that's one way to do it. Uh, other than that, I mean we keep on stalling out upon the max torque so another potential thing to do is to reduce the pump even further to get more torque out of a smaller pump that will never stall because it's because the engine's got more power that might get us to a higher psi so i think i'm hoping that with the smaller drive sprocket we can get that 30 percent will be enough to make ourselves really comfortable with the turning because right now, yes, in tight spots, I mean, when, when you're on open ground, it's not an issue. Just take a little more space to turn. But if you want to, you know, 360 out of, or like, you know, do a turn in place, which sometimes you want to do, you don't want to be moving like back and forth. You want to just do it. So 
definitely that part is is uh, desirable um, and beyond that I mean the other things we can try I mean the machine is is way overbuilt as it is right now with a half inch thick tracks I mean we can potentially lighten up some of the structure to make a lower weight machine in which case the the hydraulic motor would probably be more than enough but right now the machine is quite heavy so um, we can we can work on optimizing that but I'm hoping that a smaller drive sprocket will do the job because I do like the motors being mounted like we have right now those smaller motors rather inexpensive that those are pretty good then of course the other answer is to use little stronger motors so there's different ways to solve that issue yeah yeah okay yeah, yeah I guess um, the only thing I'm just thinking off the top of my head is that with those smaller um, like a smaller sprocket you yep. end up with like us like where the chain is is rolling across that sprocket is like a smaller OD and I remember we were Right. We're already pretty tight. In the motors, right. So we were tight good. there, but that's because we messed up the coupler at that time. So I think yeah. if we yeah. don't, we, I mean, we really overworked that and kind of made it awkward. Uh, yes, that is a consideration, but I think that's doable um, because we can make it make that sprocket like towards the end of the shaft, not like towards the motor side as we kind of had it more this time around yeah I, I think we can negotiate but definitely it's we have to work all that out in a CAD because okay. um, that's all gonna matter and it and if if we decide to do that and and we might have to end up modifying the track piece itself that's another route but uh, like for example making the tracks instead of being 10 inches wide they could be six inches wide or something and there's different ways to negotiate but yeah yeah just a little bit more to really nail that down what I do like about the overbuilt tracks is that as they are the exact system as we have now could be used for the way larger machines so that's that's the part I like because then you can be really so flexible so yeah um, yeah okay so let's keep moving on here we've got a couple of minutes um, let's see Lex there's Lex and there's uh, Michelle Michelle do you have any content to shower upon us Or Lex. Um, I don't really have an update. Uh, I'm still kind of getting back into into things from the off days. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but I'm really excited about getting my Prusa next month. So, I've been uh, you know doing a lot of research and, and uh, figuring out the thing, all, all the exciting things I'm going to print. Uh, yeah. But well, also, also kind of catching up on the 3D printer stuff that you guys are doing. So I, I mean, I'd like to my first task is going to be to replicate the use the proof set to make the OSC printer so right that would be very cool and then um, I mean I would suggest that the high priority there is the, the extruder is the weak point in the whole system so I would um, depending on where Roberto is at that time we want to really nail the extruder part because that gets us so after the Prusa extruder is going to be the three millimeter extruder which then we can print rubber and other things because I mean a practical thing that we could be doing is things like rubber tracks for the the tractor I mean that's practical I mean we'd have to have access to low-cost printing filament which right now would be unaffordable but once we do the filament maker and we can go from rubber scrap thermoplastic elastomer scrap and we can talk about practical ways to print things like rubber tracks and other things so yeah, we we definitely want to go uh, forward on the extruders. Um, no, for the rubber, is, is the film is that the uh, Lyman uh, one that we can use, or do we have to wait for the thunder? Well, Lyman could probably do it. Well, Lyman is optimized the way he's got it working with ABS right now. I'm sure you can do something with it, but it's it's a matter of figuring it out, figuring out all the details of how to do that properly, and then for the thunderhead film and the extruder, the more advanced one, yeah, that could that could handle it. Uh, the advantage there being you just get higher throughput through the Thunderhead. So maybe the Lyman could be like a low, low, low brow entry level model where we can produce some filament. But if you want to run an enterprise actually producing filament for others, you probably want to go to a, a bigger one. But that's all to be determined. But we do know that the the more advanced one has got just w way more throughput. So for larger things, yeah, you probably want to use the larger, larger one. But that would be a very cool enterprise to open source that, 
uh, open source printing filament and then the whole print cluster like we talked about all of that okay um, I think we're wrapping up we're, we have a meeting coming up with Shane who's gonna join us so um, I think we can wrap this up right now and see you guys next week continue the work I'm working on a book I'm working on um, putting together some assets for, I mean continuing working on a 3d printer and then torch table so I'm pretty busy really trying to uh, but I do want to bring up the topic of all of us collaborating on on a website where we can market the 3d printer all the various assets like the product manual training for people who want to build these things I mean there's a lot of digital assets that can be created for like a nice website where which can offer kits digital products workshops um, so I suggest that you all you know kind of think about what the possibilities there are but it, it's huge I mean it's possibilities are there for for us to start bootstrapping some cash to you know to start doing this on a more full-time basis like like my complaint is that nobody's doing this for a livelihood except really myself and Katerina right now as far as rep, you know working on the OSE stuff full-time and getting revenue from that and we use the workshop model to support ourselves it's bootstrapping workshops and then we don't really produce kits right now but I'd like to add that using a print cluster where we work that all out in detail and make a bunch of useful useful things you can have certain very useful objects like cameras drones robotic arms cordless drills all these kinds of things that we can sell as kits educational kits and real practical product kits for people to um, as, as marketable products yeah but that takes all development so that's why we're doing this all right so in any case uh, I think we can wrap up here and um, I'll shut this meeting off I thank thank you everybody so same time next time next week I uh, hope to see you all there and further updates at that time thanks a lot